Well, um, I congratulated the early service on being the ones who are responsible, who understand how to work a clock, which kind of implies the opposite, but I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. You guys are the smart ones. You actually slept, so well done. Um, Well, uh, if you are new or new-ish, we are in the book of John. Uh, In the New Testament, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, written by John, yeah. Um, Not John Federoff. Which, by the way, my Google Docs auto-corrects the word John. It always wants to auto-complete to your name, which is, I don't know why Google does that for me. Um, So we have been looking ever since October 14th. Every Sunday, we've been teaching from John's chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. They have all been covering a single night of Jesus' life, believe it or not. It's taken us like five months to cover what he did in probably three to four hours. Um, and so I'm going to catch you up on where we are, because um, today is our last time of that chapter. Next week, we are going to see that Jesus is going to be betrayed, he's going to be arrested, and we have the entire movement of the crucifixion's beginning. And here we are, kind of on the, the, the threshold, if you will, and Jesus is going to spend some time praying for his followers, he's going to pray for himself, for his disciples, he also prays for us. But let me catch you up first. Because that night begins like any good night. He has a very good meal, right? And so they're eating, they're having a good time, they're laughing. And then you see Jesus, he gets up, he basically puts on a towel, and he starts to go around the room, and he washes his disciples' feet. And it's awkward. That's just my interpretation. Because washing, you know, a massage is awkward, let alone someone walking, walking around and, like, massaging your feet. And you're like, what's going on here? And then afterwards, he says, by the way, um, one of you, I know we've spent three years together, one of you is about to betray me. No, 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 no. He's like, well, actually, you're going to deny me as well. It's like, a band of brothers that have spent three years together. And he's like, what? He's like, yeah, the crucifixion, we've been talking about it, it's now. And his followers are like, are you? No. No. That's awful. He's like, and so they are, you know, dismayed. They are just distraught. They, they don't want this. Their follower, their whole life has been following him. They left everything aside. And he says, but I have some good news. In fact, it's to your benefit that I'm going to go away because there's going to be a helper. It's a bit of an understatement. God himself, the Holy Spirit, will be with you, and he will be in you, and he will be through you. And they're like, oh. He's like, so he, he brings comfort, <laughs> But he begins to describe, he's like, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. The Holy Spirit, he's going to lead you. He's going to guide you. He's going to be me with you. It's actually better, right, that I go away and the Holy Spirit is here. And so as they're going through all this, he describes that their relationship, that Jesus is still going to be with them through the Holy Spirit. He's like, it's like a vine and a branch. We spent a whole month about the abiding life. And Jesus says, we're still connected. We are still together. It's going to be great but by the way, yeah, they're going to treat you the way they, they're going to treat me. And they're about to arrest me, falsely accuse me, beat me, torture me, and kill me. By the way, for us, that's our leader. Why would we expect any different? And he's saying, yeah, great hardship. <laughs> he says, but I love last week, the big conclusion, take heart. I have overcome the world. And so Jesus, I mean, just emotionally put yourself there. That all of that happens in the course of hours. And yes, he's been preparing him. He's not telling him anything new that he hasn't been telling him. But just the emotional weight of like foot washing to betrayal to this amazing intimacy, the, the fact that God would be in me and the Holy Spirit and like all this and I'm gone, but don't worry. Like, it's a bit of a roller coaster. Would you agree? And then the capstone of the night is what we are reading today in John 17, if you want to start turning there. But Jesus, he's going to pray. And I love prayer. Prayer is simply talking to God. If you're talking to Jesus, you really can't do it wrong. You can say what you want, when you want, where you want, how you want. It's great. He loves you. But something is unique about when Jesus prays. See, when we pray, we're talking to God. When Jesus is praying, it's God talking to God. A little different. <laughs> and so something, I'm kind of lay this foundation as we're getting started here. 
that we believe in the Trinity. In fact, we're going to sing a song about the Trinity afterwards in conclusion. But like, we believe the Bible is unambiguous. There is one God. Right? One of the greatest heresies that blasts me. You would actually be murdered if you said that there was more than one God in the Jewish culture. And so there is one God. And the scripture is also clear that we have God the Father, we have God the Son, and we have God the Holy Spirit. So we have the word Trinity to describe this. It's the triune God. Tri is in three. Yun is in one. Trinity, the three in one. The difficulty, we were talking about this. I want to give you some analogy of what that can look like, but every single analogy is actually blasphemy. (laughs) Because it's something we cannot understand. This is not a thing that I have a hard time explaining. I just, I can't. It is not to be explained. Uh, Someone described it to me this one time. It's like, in the same way, pardon my example here. I'm going to kind of insult us here. A dog can't conceive of the complexity of a human, right? There's this huge gap. I talk to my dog all the time. He just stares. (laughs) He knows he's probably going to drop some crackers pretty soon. Don't worry. A dog can't conceive of the complexity of a human. Why would we think that we can conceive of the complexity of the God who made all of this? Right? There's going to be a gap. And it's not just a matter of knowledge. It's a matter of like, ability. We just can't wrap our minds around this. It's one of the great mysteries of our faith. We believe that you know, the fact that Jesus is God and Jesus is man, that's a mystery. We can't understand it. 100% God, 100% man. And the fact that there are three and one. It, it's, they're, 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 we don't hide this. Like, it, it, we don't understand it, but the scriptures teach it. So we're going to hold it. We're going to make a word, Trinity, to describe this. So as Jesus is praying, you have God the Son talking to his dad, God. And so we're going to see kind of this inner relationship of how the son's talking to the dad. And a lot of this prayer, I think, is just enjoyable to see, like, oh, my gosh. It's like the Us Weekly of, like, they're just like us. He's talking to his dad, and they're kind of going back and forth. And there's like a, he's asking his dad to do things, and it's kind of fun. And so we're going to read, um, if you're there or not, not there already, John 17. We're going to read the first five verses where Jesus He's praying for himself. So here we go. John 17, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Right? Crucifixion's here. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Since you've given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you've given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you've given me to do, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had before the world existed. We're going to pause there for now. If you're a little confused at what we just read, you're not alone. Because Jesus kind of goes back and forth, and the central thing he's talking about here is this word glory. And so I want us to understand this word. It can be so churchified that we say it all the time, but we don't know what it even means. So if that's you, you're not alone. That was me. And so the word glory, it's similar to the word beauty. Like think for a second. If I asked you right now, come up on the stage, define beauty. You'd probably be stuck for words of like, well, I like it and it's pretty and I want to see it. And like you feel kind of silly trying to describe it. Glory can have a very similar effect, that when we define it, it almost kind of kills it (laughs) in some ways, but to experience it, you're like, I get it. I know when I see something beautiful. I know when I, you know, I'm going to Yosemite this summer. I know when, as soon as I go through that little tunnel, like, oh, the valley of Yosemite, you just, it takes your breath away. It's beautiful. The glory of God, I think, is also meant to be experienced, but I'm going to define it anyway, so stick with me on this part here. So glory, it means high renown or honor one or displaying a reputation. Does that make sense? So it's the idea of something that is full of honor, something that is of high renown, we regard it well, and it's the display of that reputation, right? So if you're going to honor someone, you have like, you know, a, a benefit in their honor, and people share a bunch of good stories, and like, hey, let me tell you about when they did this, let me tell you about when they do that. We want to honor people like that. It's kind of the glory of that person. But let me give you the better way to understand glory, and I'm going to bring you back to 1993, 
I'm in middle school. And let me tell you about the time I got to see Michael Jordan play basketball. <laughs> see, I'm a Kings fan, which means naturally the Bulls are going to stomp the Kings. Um, and I'm, as I'm going into Arco Arena, my dad got tickets, and I was going to actually see his Aaronist, the dude with the poster with the wings. And you guys know what I'm talking about? He knows. All right. And so walking in, like, the second we got in the gates, as soon as they were open, we wanted to get there early because he's here, right? And even in the layup line, he's doing his, like, little thing with a little finger roll, and I'm like, oh, look how he goes. And everyone is just raving because it's him. And we know he's going to stomp the kings because they're the kings, number one. But also, he's good. He's amazing. And the, the whole crowd is filled with Jordan jerseys. It doesn't matter that he's the visiting, like, no. We are in awe and we are in wonder because look at how, look what he does. Wow. That's glory. That sense of when walking in the arena, before I even see him, I feel, <gasps> well, the Bible just describes that the temple is filled with the glory of God. That sense of awe, that sense of wonder, that renown of like, look how amazing and how good he is. That's the glory of God. It's his renown on full display. And in these verses, verses 2 and 3, they even tell you, want to see the epitome of God's glory? The cross. He says, look, you've given eternal life. And so for us, as we envision the cross, the thing that's happening mere hours after he's praying here, look at how good God is. That we see a torture and we see a cruel death of Jesus that he chose because he loves you. I have people who love me in my life, but no one loves me like that. What glory that he would love us so much. The fact that God is so just that he doesn't just merely excuse wrongdoings. No, he will exact justice in this world. But what mercy that he says, I'll take it myself. What glory. Look how good he is. No one would do that. And the fact that the cross is nothing compared to an empty tomb. He didn't stay dead. Death was undefeated until this point. And Jesus defeats death. He defeats sin. He, defe he defeats it all. And he is risen as the glorious Savior. Because, are you kidding me? What glory? Does that make sense? And so as Jesus is talking about the glory, you can go back and read this. And he's basically saying, before I came to earth, I was glorified in heaven because I'm Jesus. Pretty amazing. He's like, I'm coming to earth, and my point on earth is Jesus is walking around to show us what the Father is like. To see Jesus is to see the Father. And so he is showing the glory of the Father by the way he interacts with people, by his power and the miracles, but also the teaching and the goodness and his character on display. He shows the glory of God. And he's saying, I'm about to be glorified on the cross, but I ain't staying on the cross. I'm coming back to heaven. Dad, I want my seat back. <laughs> I want to be glorified in heaven again. And so this prayer, we see this conversation between the son and the dad. He's basically saying, Dad, I did it. I did it. You got all the glory because that was my job. Now, a little sneak peek here. This is also our job. If you want to summarize the Christian life, we glorify God not by wearing Jordan jerseys, but by basically being little Jesus jerseys as we go and talking about his greatness and his goodness and his mercy and his love. We can even talk about his justice at times. Imagine that. That's the picture. We are in filled with awe and wonder at how, oh, how glorious he is. We're going to keep reading here. He just prayed for himself, and then verses 6 to 19, he's going to be praying for his direct disciples, kind of the, at this point, 11 left in that room. But what he prays for them, he also prays for us. And so Jesus prays similar to us. It's kind of like spaghetti. He doesn't give a thesis statement and then a paragraph that's point one, a paragraph that's point two. He goes back and forth and all over the place. So I'm going to give you guys kind of a roadmap before we read this, so hopefully you can kind of pull it out. He's going to pray for three things. The first one, he's praying for unity, that they would act as one. Second one, he's praying for that they would live with mission. And lastly, that they would just have full of joy. I was going to say oodles of joy, but we're not kids. 
But you can also have oodles of joy too, I guess. Let me read verse 6 to 19. If you guys want to turn there, John 17. But listen to those three things. Here's Jesus, once again, talking to his dad. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they've kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from, from you, for I've given them the words that you gave me, and they've received them, and they've come to know the truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you've given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you've given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, and you've given me. I've guarded them. Not one of them has been lost except for the son of destruction. We're talking about Judas there. That the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you. And these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And as you sent me into the world... So I have sent them into the world. For their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. So we're just going to pull these big ideas because you're going to see one idea show up in like verse 11, verse 15, verse 19. Like, so I'm going to kind of like pull them together. And the first big idea, he's praying for his followers that they would act as one. He's not praying that they would be unified because he's already made them unified. See, for us, when we speak of unity and following Jesus, what Jesus says here is actually so much more beyond what I'm even comfortable teaching you. Because this is what Jesus is saying. Remember how I spoke of the, the blasphemy, if we were to say that God, that there's more than one God, right? That there's one God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are united. Jesus uses that as the illustration that we are united to one another. Let me say that again. The same way God is one, he says that we, followers of Jesus, are one. That's incredible. That, like, literally, that's like, Jesus, are you sure? It's like, well, I'm not going to argue. He's Jesus. He's, he, he's got it right. And so unity is not something we have to achieve or earn. It's something we just have to live in light of. He's already made us one. one if you want to do further study, um, it's Ephesians chapter 4. Paul talks about this, and he doesn't tell them that they should act united. He says, act in a manner worthy of what you've been called. He says, you've already been made one. There's one faith, one father, one baptism. You're, you're one. You're one. Just act like it. You know, so much of my parenting is seeing my kids and it's like, here's what the Patterson name means, and I'm going to show you what it means to act like a Patterson. How much more? Here's what the name, we bear the name of God. We are image bearers. We represent God. We are the glory of God. Act like it. You're already it. You already made a son. You're already made a daughter. Unity is something we already are. We seem to act like it. And this, I think, breaks down for a lot of us because in, I think inadvertently, we, we think that unity means uniformity. Just inevitably. That we start to think, okay, how can we be united? And so we'll unite behind a style of music. Or we'll unite behind a social justice cause. Right now, the world... Everyone is pro-unity in this world. I don't know if you know this, right? I have no doubt even Putin is saying, what I'm doing is to bring about unity, right? Everyone's pro-unity. We can't find unity because of our differences if we make those differences the thing we unite around. If we unite around making a difference in this city, oh my gosh, it's so important. 
but that's not enough. If we unite around even saying that this is God's word and we're going to make a big deal about God's word, even that is not enough. Good things, really good things. And so what we tend to do is we tend to settle for preferences and say those are our unity. And so we can sometimes say we're a church of a certain demographic, of a certain economic demographic. Maybe it's a racial demographic. We find all these different things and we say, hey, we're united. But someone walks in and says, you're all white suburbanites. <laughs> you sure that's not your unity? Or you walk in and like, oh, you guys all vote right or you all vote left. Are you sure that's not your unity? And it's ironically, it's the diversity that points to our unity. He made different gifts. He made different races, different cultures, different languages. And it's like, how beautiful is it? And how much more does it point to the glory of God that those aren't the things that we have to have in common? Wow, they're important, but guess what? We're not going to whitewash them. We're going to say they're beautiful. And they make this tapestry because we're all about Jesus. And so this unity, it's not uniformity. It's not just, you know, corporate speak of rowing in the same direction. It's, it's genuine oneness. He's like, you already have it. Like, look around the room. These are brothers and sisters, and you are one. Eliminate the walls. Look around the city. Look around across geopolitical borders. We are one with Christians in Ukraine. We're even one with Christians in Russia. We think of history of all the conflict and racial divides or all the things that have happened. It's like, guess what? We're still one. That's amazing. Only Jesus has enough glory to bring true unity in this world. It, it's funny. Uh, this is kind of a pre-announcement. But in the coming weeks, you're going to start hearing us talk about Easter. It's kind of a big deal for us around here. Jesus rose from the grave. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, Something we're doing this year, we've always wanted to do this, um, but we want to, we're uniting our marketing campaigns um, be, with several churches because we want to have the same inescapable message that Jesus is what matters. And so we're all going to be promoting things the same way. So we want the word to get out, not because, hey, look at Anthem, we're such a big deal. It's like, no, we're not. Jesus is a big deal. Calvary's a big deal. No, we're not. It's, Jesus is a big deal. And so even that, we're trying to point to a unity because it's a truth that we often settle for something less than. And there's a calling in Jesus' prayer here to live at a greater narrative than just the things that we can settle for, even as followers of Jesus. We are made one. And I don't think it's a coincidence that when he speaks of unity, he also speaks of the mission we have. Because it's easy for us to find difference and infighting when we're just sitting around with nothing better to do, but when there's an actual mission to go, we live as if we are one. And that's his second point, that he prays that they would be a people with mission. It's kind of fun. The book of John, we've been going on it for um, almost a year and a half now. Jesus is called sent. The word sent, it's like he is the sent one of God or God has sent me. That word is used 44 times to describe Jesus. It's a lot. Did you guys catch what happened in verse 18? I think you're going to throw it back up there. Jesus says, talking to the Father, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. The very mission that Jesus came to do, he runs the race and he hands the baton and says, you have that same mission. Think about that. Fortunately, we don't need to die on a cross. That part has been settled and it's been accomplished. (laughs) Praise God. (laughs) But we get to run with the same purpose and meaning in the same way we look at Jesus like, wow, what an incredible life. He says, yes, and I give it to you. Run. Glorify the Father the same way I did. And so we live with meaning. We are sent. One of my favorite pastors, his name is J.D. Greer, he says this, the church doesn't have a mission. The church is the mission. Charles Spurgeon, another amazing author, he says, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. See, for some reason in our brains, we start to think that I can step across the line, I can say, Jesus, I need you. Wow, I'm saved. 
And then I'm kind of the junior varsity for a while while I get my life together. And then eventually, someday, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go varsity. I'll let her in Jesus, and I'll do it. Like, no! There's no junior varsity. He's like, you, Jesus has saved you, and as he saves you, he says, there's fellow brothers and sisters next to you that need saving. Go. I don't know what I'm doing. He's like, don't worry about it. <laughs> we'll figure that out. Go. And so we are sent. The biblical images that they constantly use as the first one is that we are witnesses, right? Just like in a courtroom, a, wit a witness has to tell, what did you see? What did you hear? What did you experience? Guess what we are supposed to do? What have you seen? What have you heard? What have you experienced? How has Jesus affected your life? Tell them. I have no problem telling you stories about Michael Jordan from 1993. How much more has Jesus changed my life than his airness, right? Tell them. Witness. Be a witness wherever you go. Another imagery is that of an ambassador, and this one I love, right? When we think of the United Nations, we have all these countries and their ambassadors. It would be really weird if they all decided that they need to wear business suits and eat like burgers and fries because, well, they're here and their job is to assimilate to us. It's like, no, an ambassador's job is to represent their host nation and to export or to import the culture of that nation and to represent them. You and I, we are citizens of heaven. We, be we don't belong here, right? He says we're not of this world. We belong in heaven, but we're here for a purpose. Someone said once, like, we're citizens of heaven and we're here on a work visa, right? We have a job to do, not just to assimilate, but to represent the culture of heaven wherever we go. That's beautiful. Other times, John likes to describe it as light. Think of right what happened right now if we shut off all the lights in here. It's like, okay, we would have a problem. We'd stumble around. And we'd say, get communion. Everyone just like this huge dog pile develops. And it's like, oh, it's death and destruction. We need some light. It's like this world needs truth. It needs some light. That's what you are. Jesus was the light, and he says, now you are the light of the world. And so all these images just point to the fact of we have immense responsibility. We act, but really, we have immense meaning to our life. The way I spend my money can change forever in some people's life. The way where I work, where I live, the way I interact with my boss, the way I lead my business, it can change eternity. It matters because we're sent. Isn't that incredible? It's not just how we parent our kids, as important as it is. It's how do we interact with this world now, it's, it's interesting because I, I want to point out something Jesus isn't saying here. I'm going I'm to ruffle some feathers for a moment here. Jesus isn't praying that his followers would stay safe. Did you guys catch that? Because one of the most common ways we like, we'll look, use this prayer is that we can use some of these words he uses and we change their interpretation just a little bit. And it, it sounds like, oh, I got to protect I got to sanitize my life and live a life completely secluded from the world around us. And he's like, no, I didn't pull you from the world for this very reason. You have a job to do. The word sanctified, a lot of times we think it means to be removed. It doesn't mean that. The word sanctified means dedicated for the exclusive purpose of. So let me give you an example. So yesterday morning we had pancakes. And I have one spatula. It's my favorite pancake spatula. It is to be used for nothing else because, you know, you use it for something else and it gets that weird little, like, groove in the front. And you're like, no, it always jacks up the pancakes. So I have the pancake spatula. It's the good one. It is dedicated to the cause of pancakes in our house. Do not take my spatula. We are dedicated to the purpose of representing God. That is the meaning to our life. We're set aside, not to be removed, but to be used for his purpose. That's what it means to be sanctified. That phrase, not of this world, back in the 90s we had entire marketing campaigns about like, hey, I'm not of this world. What does that mean? It means I don't know anybody who doesn't go to a church. And as a youth pastor, I was like, ah, I don't think that means what we thought that it means, guys. And he's saying, no, I'm sending you into the church. 
There is a call to purity, but it's not a call to be removed. It's a call to saying, no, represent. Right? In verse 15, I asked that you, I did not ask that you take them out of the world, but you would keep them from the evil one. He does pray for protection. Let me be crystal clear here. But in the same way, when we pray for a soldier who's going on to you know, a tour of duty, we want them to be safe. But what they are doing is inherently not safe. If they wanted to be safe, they just don't go. <laughs> and so when we pray, like, their job is, yeah, they don't want to be reckless and foolish, but a lot of the prayers that Jesus gives them is that they would be protected from the evil one, right? A soldier, we're not just saying good luck, we're saying here's a rifle, here's armor, here's a helmet, here's a calm thing, here's boot camp, we're going to give you training, we're going to give you all the tools you need because you're going for purpose. And by the way, yeah, I'm going to pray for you, but we're not trying to protect you. Your job is to, to go, to advance. And so I love it because the whole, he actually references some of the um, equipment they need. He says, the Holy Spirit is with you, right? Jesus, through the Spirit, is going to be with them. He's like, I'm going to be there. I'll give you giftedness. I'll give you words when you need to say words. I'll, I'll do, I, I, I'm God. I can kind of do what I need to do, and I'm with you. And I love it because every time God says go somewhere, he always promises his presence. You guys know, I don't know if you noticed that in Scripture. But there seems to almost be a double dose, right? Now, this, this could be theologically fraught, so please forgive me if this is wrong. God is everywhere. God is with us. So it doesn't matter where we are. If we are alone, we are never truly alone because God is with us. But there seems to be this extra helping of the filling of the Spirit that is promised as we go. He promises his presence. So I think first the example of this comes to mind is that of Moses, where Moses is talking to a burning bush, and he said, you're going to go to the biggest world power of this time, Pharaoh in Egypt, and you're going to say, let all the slaves go. And it's like, ah, I don't know. And then God's response is, I'm going with you. <laughs> right? He even, gives, he even gives Moses some kind of tricks to show his presence is with him. I think they're more for Moses' benefit than for Pharaoh's benefit. And then when Moses is done, the next up is Joshua. And Joshua is staring down at a military conquest. And he's like, I don't know if I can do it. And he's like, just like I was with Moses, I'm going with you. Don't, don't swerve to the left and the right. Trust me. When Jesus, as he is ascending into heaven, after he's already been resurrected, he looks at his disciples and he says, go make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey all I've commanded. And by the way, I'm with you. I'm not leaving you. And for me, I'm going to confess, sometimes I want the power and just kind of the, the, the experience of God just so I can sing songs more, just so I can feel better at a difficult situation. And those aren't things that are wrong to pray for. But I wonder, where is the miraculous in my life? And it's like, well, are you going? Are you living as a sent one? And often the answer is like, well, I'm just trying to get by with me and mine. And once I figure this out, then I can go. I don't think those are disconnected. There seems to be special fillings of the Spirit. And so he gives them the Holy Spirit, and he also says, I've given them your words. We can interpret that as scripture, as the Bible here, but he's telling them they don't have the Bible yet. <laughs> they haven't written it yet. They haven't written the New Testament. And so it's really the truth, the true words that Jesus has told them about God the Father. And so the last thing he prays for in this section is he prays that they would be a people full of joy. See, all these, I think, are meant to work together. That it's not just, oh, go be unified. Oh, that means just gather over there and go you know, hold concerts for unity and stuff like that. It's like, no, 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 you're sent into this world. And the biggest display, I think, of God's glory as we are sent is the unity, right? It's like, don't go by yourself. Go with people, right? That's, that's how you display God's glory. And he's like, and by the way, this is the greatest life you can imagine. This is not a task you have to do to add to your to-do list that you can never get around to. He is saying the very purpose of your life, when you live that, oh, there's going to be so much joy. 
Look at the verse, verse 13, right? It says that they may have joy, my joy fulfilled in themselves. That the lifestyle that we are living, that's where joy is going to come from. This is not just happiness, right? We're not going to find joy on a beach with a drink in hand, although that tends to be the goal more often than not. It's a good time. But it ain't going to be joy. (laughs) It's not going to come by me getting all the things I really want. Joy is going to come from a life of purpose and meaning. Hope is going to come from seeing the truth of God in the dark places. Love is going to come not just from something I can drum up for myself or from others or even from a great marriage. It's going to come from like, wow, the God of the universe desperately and deeply loves us. And so he's like, this is joy. Matt has said at times, he calls it the grand gospel adventure. That for you and I, as we are these image bearers, that we represent Jesus, we wear the Jesus jerseys, right? And we tell of his glory. That there is this uncharted path that you and I, we get to live. That the way I spend money, the way I lead business, the way I live my life, it has deep meaning. And he's like, how are you going to do that? And he's like, figure it out and enjoy. See, I I grew up in the church. My dad's a pastor. He's going on 40 years this summer. It's nuts. Up in Sacramento. And just nothing that they did wrong. But I grew up assuming that my goal in life was, I was being told to be safe. I was told to be a good little boy. And that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And you see Jesus saying, no, man. Get your helmet. Get your rifle. Go. The world is going to want to divide you. Think of, think of the world we live in right now. The Q score for Christianity is an all-time low. <laughs> right? We don't have a very good reputation right now. The, the last few years of this deep division, exposing centuries of deep division, it's hard. Right now, like, I think you know, parenting is one of the hardest things in life right now. Our kids have been going through it. Everything in us wants to say, let's... Let's settle. Let me just, oh, God, just give me the grace for this. That's all I can handle right now. And I'm so glad Jesus prays this prayer. He's like, there is so much joy that comes not in the fear. There's going to be joy that's going to come as you live for purpose, as you live for meaning, as you use these skills that you've developed that you've been only told can only work in the business world. He's like, no, represent me with these skills. Live your life and go live this grand adventure. Everywhere you go, show his glory. Everywhere you go, believers there, you are one with them. This is a good, amazing life. Think about it. Right now, we are God's plan A for Thousand Oaks. God has people here he desperately loves that don't know about him yet. And he's like, sweet, sweet. I have Walter here, I have Kyle here, I have Adriana here. This is my plan A, this is the team. I look around like, are you kidding me, this is the team? (laughs) He's like, yeah, by the way, I'm with you. We're like, oh, okay. (laughs) He's like, this tremendous joy, and we get to live a life of meaning and purpose, and that's exactly what Jesus is praying for. He tells us to go, he tells us to live like we already are. So we're going to respond in worship, and I'm going to call the band up here. The way we kind of do this in Anthem, we believe that when God speaks, right, we have God's word here, our life is a response to God. And so we would like to have a times of singing and stuff as a response to what God has done. Now, I had a whole plan of what I thought I was going to do here, but what God is doing in your own hearts, I want you to be sensitive to whatever that happens to be. And so we have some methods of response But really, I want you to respond with whatever the Lord is tugging on your heart to do. So we're going to sing some awesome songs. Sing about them. They're not about you. They're about Jesus. Way better than you. (laughs) And he invites you into his story. I love it. We're singing a lot of songs about the Trinity today. And I love it. It's such a beautiful thing of like, yes, lift your eyes. If God is doing something in you and you want to receive prayer, go get prayer. Ahmad and Ashley, they're back there. Amazing people. Pray with people. Or if you know someone next to you, just say, hey, you know what? Could you pray for me? It's the greatest gift we can give each other. We also have communion here, where we take the cracker. We don't drink out of the juice cup, by the way, please. 
That's not even a COVID issue. That's just like general germs. Um, you take the cracker and you kind of dip it in the juice. And we recognize the cracker, it represents his broken body on the cross. The juice is his spilt blood that was shed for us. That's how we are made one. That's how we are forgiven. That's how we are free because of what he did for us. So we celebrate his death. Take it by yourself. Take it with people. I know community groups tend to like huddle up. It's beautiful. Move around. For the sake of like, you know, uh, paths, kind of come up the middle, work your way back around like a little airplane. Um, We have buckets here for money. We want to give and give generously to the Lord. We have online stuff. But really what I want to emphasize is the biggest act of worship that we can do is what happens in 15 minutes from now. It's the next six and three quarters days that you have. <laughs> Living a life as a sent one of God. That's the act of worship. That's what's holy and pleasing, is to give ourselves and say, you know what, as I clock in, as I'm home, as I'm exhausted, as I, you know, spouse, whatever you want to call it, I want to, I want to honor God. I want to show his glory and his goodness in my day. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing. Jesus, I thank you so much that you would see us, not only that you would make us, Lord, but you would give us meaning and purpose, and that we don't have to wonder and speculate what God could be like. Jesus, you showed us exactly who God is. And so, Jesus, what an encouragement, Lord, that you would pray for us exactly what we need right now, to remind us that we're actually not alone, that we are united, that we are one, and we have family and brothers and sisters. Well, that we don't have to give in to fear, but we can take heart that you have overcome the world and you are here with us. And God, that our lives are not meaningless. They're not clocking in and out. We have purpose. And so God, as, as you are kind of working in our own minds and our own hearts, I pray that we could respond accordingly, or that we would not have any social pressure, that we would not have, give in to any other voice but your voice that invites us into more, into more, into freedom. So Lord, we want to respond, we want to sing aloud, we want to do and give our life to you because only you are worthy of our life, of our best. Amen.